my name is Adam Murray and welcome to a very special Extra Time, where we look at the state of hurling and discuss the need for change. Joining Bevan, Mr Briggs and myself today are Clan A great Billy Welsh, an offered performance uh, analyst under Derek McGrath, Tomas Rua Kiley. Welcome to the show, lads. Hey, how are you going, Adam? Thanks, Adam. You see, Adam, one of the main reasons we... Uh, brought these uh, fine people together is because we want to have a discussion on the state of Harlem um, as a whole. Now, something that um, kind of sparked this interest to me, I just want to give a plug out here to uh, Hurler on the Ditch on Twitter. And he wrote a great piece the other day um, on what's gone wrong with the modern game. Now, maybe that, that slant might be slightly uh, disparaging to Hurling at the moment. So we're going to look at the kind of the pros and the cons. But if there's anyone watching the video and they don't, um, they don't follow him. I'd highly recommend that he's some great takes on the game. And for those people who don't have Twitter, like he also has his own website as well, which he puts the same articles up. Um, so you know, always you know, great to spark a bit of debate in the GEA. And I suppose anyone who loves hurling, which I would suggest that everyone on this podcast does, well, then it's great to have an opinion, and maybe some of those will vary um, as we go along. So. Uh, Adam, do you want to get the ball rolling there? Yeah, I suppose the first thing we're going to look at is the, the general state of hurling, I suppose. The actual game itself and I suppose the inter-county scene. So how do you think that is at the moment, uh, Mr Briggs? Um, yeah, like uh, it's funny, I suppose it, it often happens. It's, it's a generational thing in that, you know, y y you're there now and you're watching Hurling and to you it's probably the best it's ever been and to me I remember back in say the 90s and the thousands thinking gee Hurling is the best it's ever been but funnily enough I watched the Cork Walford game there and um, the famous one where Kevin McGrath caught it at the end was that 2006 is that right and um, uh, could have been four there was a couple of games that, and I thought this game is nowhere near as good as I thought it was and the state of modern hurling is just phenomenal now, the speed, the fitness levels and everything. So I suppose, um, to me, the game is in a brilliant place, but that doesn't mean that there, there can't be small changes applied. And, you know, to me also, following rugby, one of the big things about rugby is that no matter what stage rugby is at in terms of popularity or entertainment, they're consistently tweaking the rules to make it more entertaining. And I suppose that's what we're going to be looking at today. But in terms of the spectacle at the moment, you get and skill wise and fitness wise, I think Harlan is probably in the best place it's it's ever been. It's just making small tweaks. Um, what do you think, Billy? Um, you see. Like, 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 good, good can mean different things to different people. So, so for instance, I saw a match one time and I thought it was an absolute rubbish match. But just because the team that my friend wanted to win and they played well, they thought it was a good match. And some people attribute 60 scores in a game to be a great match. But so, so I think if you look at it, I think if you took every ingredient of the game, in the modern game, it should be a great spectacle because there's no, no one can question the skill level of the players is unbelievable. The fitness level is unbelievable. The tactics are unbelievable. Um, the scores they're getting are unbelievable. But I kind of think too far east is west. So, so if you remember The Rock, remember he came out and he hit your man a shoulder and he put the ball over from his own 20, right? And a big cheer. But Austin Gleeson, I've seen him do that umpteen times in Welsh Park not the hit now but the, the striking a ball from 100 yards and it's kind of at the stage now where we're so accustomed to these scores that it's like ah yeah whatever it's another one um, so that, that's kind of I suppose one problem I have is they're actually too good the second thing is you know I, I don't mean too good I mean I mean the players are so good that it doesn't actually lead to a spectacle because in all the great games, there's mistakes and the mistakes lead to goals and, and different things. So, like, if you looked at the perfect game, there'd be no mistakes in it. That wouldn't be a very enjoyable game to watch. You know, it's like it's like Johnny Giles and Eamon Dunphy analysing the defensive mistakes. Yeah, but if there's no defensive mistakes, there's no entertainment. Um, the, the one thing I will say is, we, we say that the players now haven't, ever been they've never been as skillful and 
true to an extent. However, look at ground hurling, it's gone. Overhead striking, it's gone. Um, Dublin on a ball, it's gone. Like, so, and those skills, like those skills were real uh, refreshing skills. You know, if you see a guy pull on a ball now or you see a guy doubling on a ball now, you actually kind of go, oh, she's lovely to see. Or one of the things I really miss is Joe Canning is actually, he keep Joe Canning's the only player, modern player now that does it, is he just picks and strikes in one movement and moves the ball. Whereas everyone now gets the ball in their hands, takes their step, looks up, and throws the ball around. Some people like that. Um, I think it leads to a more, I don't know, basketball type game with phases, puck out, man gets a ball, carries it, throws it onto the next man. Um, the rocks, the, like the rocks are a, the rocks are a sin, like to be honest there, you know, and, and I get it because managers want to win. So they'll do the best they can for their team to win the game. But the GAA's responsibility is to have the game in the best state it can be. And I don't think now the game is leading itself to that. And it's not the player's fault. It's not the manager's fault. It's just, I don't know. I just think it needs a few tweaks. I'll just keep going. I'll only take for another minute. But but you take now, right? If a man solos at you, the referee is going to give him 10 steps. So how can you defend that without fouling him? So that's leading to this game where there's a load of fouls, there's a load of lads carrying the ball into a tackle because they're told break the tackle. Whereas you look back in the 90s, if you if you went to solo past a guy, you'd probably be chopped in two. Like now, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it did it did kind of it did get people moving the ball quicker as opposed to just taking on the man all the time. Yeah, yeah well, look, we'll, we'll get into some of the more nitty gritty. Uh, but I, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, Rue, what's your, what, what's your take on it? Well, to be honest with you, I think over the past couple of months, I've had a more exposure to the older game. So my brother took it on for the past four months to go converting the old VHS tapes we had in the house from the mid-90s onwards onto hard drive. So just out of curiosity, I've actually looked back on some of them from the point of view of the quality of the games and, you know, to see could you see any tactical differences between between then and now and I think it's I think it's unbelievable the difference that's there and I'm, I'm nearly at the point now where I reckon that if you took the Clare team that won the All-Ireland in 1995 and put them again up against the All-Ireland club championship champions of recent years I reckon it would be a solid game I actually reckon the club champions could could beat them you know I know now 25 years later um, or nearly 30 years later it's not possible that you do that but I think the same as you, Shane, from the perspective of looking back at the Waterford games that we all enjoyed and we went in the mid-2000s. And, you know, they were, they were carnival games. Like, there was 323 scored and you could lose. And I think, I think that was probably part of their downfall at the time as well, is that, you know, they were going into these games, especially the Cork and Waterford games are the ones that we remember most. And it was like a runaway train. You didn't know what was going to happen. You know, you go out and score 323 and you weren't really sure as to whether you'd win or not. Now, at the time, if you scored 323, you'd almost guarantee yourself that you were going to win. But I think part of what they were missing at the time and part of what every team is looking for at the moment is control when they go on the field. And I think rugby is something is something huge. You mentioned rugby earlier. That's one thing that every rugby team tries to do when they, when they go out onto the field is have control of the game have control of what's happening. And if you were to be critical at all of the Waterford team of the mid-2000s, there was absolutely no control. It was just, you went out, you did your best. If your best was good enough to win, you won. But you, you didn't really allow for what the opposition are going to do to you. And I think that's, that's part of what has evolved over the past while. I think it's part of maybe what Billy doesn't like in the fact that you're now trying to set yourself up. You know, there's a certain amount of damage limitation and you're trying to say to yourself, right, what are the things that the opposition team are going to do against us? How are we going to prevent those? And how are we going to impose our game on them? So I think there's an awful lot more thought goes into the preparation of these teams now than there was then. Personally, I feel it adds to it. I think the game has never been faster. I think the elements that Billy talked about there, the ground hurling, the overhead striking, the Dublin, at this stage of the game in modern football or hurling, 
it's a sin to give the ball away. It's a sin to turn the ball over. And I think in those scenarios now, at any stage of the game, the player is trying to keep possession of the ball. And with ground hurling, overhead strike in Dublin, the chances of you doing that against the chance of you trapping the ball and keeping the ball in your possession are, are, are very different. So I think, you know, you will see a fellow doubling the ball in front of the goal if he gets a chance. But if he's out in the middle of the field, he's not going to be doubling the ball and trying to give a 50-50 ball into his forward line. He's trying to make that 80-20 for his team. So... I think these things have evolved, but I think we're all the better for it, to be honest with you. Yeah, look, I mean, I, 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 even from a coaching point of view, I think I'd go out and absolutely flake the fella if I saw him dubbing on the ball in the middle of the field. Um, but like a, a few, a bit of it goes back to that kind of romanticism as well. You mentioned like, you know, remember if we're following Munster, but pre Heineken Cup first one. And like you said, anything could happen if they were playing um, it was going for that search for that holy grail that made it much more interesting. Same at Waterford back in the late nineties, thousands. Like anything could happen, and there was a romantic side of it. And you know what? People wanted to follow the team. But then I look on the other side of it, and I see Billy, and, and he's talking about that kind of robotic uh, hurling that maybe has crept in over the last number of years. And there's there's definitely up until last year, there's a, an argument to be said that less people were more passionate about Waterford due to sweepers and systems and all those things. So I think there's somewhere to be married in between. Adam, I'd be interested in getting your point of view now. Like, we've grown up in both eras, right? Whereas you probably, you're like us now, you're looking back at the All-Ireland gold and you're seeing something from 20 years ago going, wow, like, you I mean, that's so poor. And you're seeing modern hurling. How do you see the game at the moment? Uh, well, I suppose it's probably, it's probably gone to a level where it's kind of... Um, it's nearly gone too tactical or too kind of, uh, like you were saying, there's too much kind of thinking about what you're going to do before you actually go out and just, just try and express yourself. Like, And then on the other hand, you're looking back at the old games and there's nearly there's nearly no thinking going on. They're just driving the ball <laughs> the field. Like, and like if you did it now, like you wouldn't do it in a junior B match. Like, So there's probably, a, there's probably an element of bottom that you could bring to... To make the perfect game, like, but uh, it's probably, it's probably, it's probably like it's changing the whole time. So it could be a time where it nearly go back to that way. You just wouldn't know what way it could go, like. And Devin, like I suppose there's been there's been even big changes in the Camogie recently, but we we can kind of take both games together because both games are kind of evolving at the same rate. And um, like, how, how do you see both sports going? Especially, you know, have a look back at some of the games from previous and see them now. Um, for Hurlan, I don't know if you would agree now, but I think lately Limerick seem to be doing it the most is hand passing. Like they seem to be just hand passing and working up the field. And it's kind of turning a bit like football almost. Instead of just lettering the ball into the full forward or anything like that, they're just working the ball from the backs straight up to, say, midfield, half forward and popping the ball over the bar. So I don't know how I feel about the hand passing. Like, you're obviously not giving away as much possession because you're not making mistakes. But I, I just don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of it. I like seeing a high ball into full forward and catching it and then maybe a goal. But that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> No, nope, uh, I, I, I don't think you'll get too many people who would disagree with you on the hand passing issue. Anyway, um, right. So look, let's let's get into the more the nitty gritty stuff of it. So, um, what do you want to start with, Adam? Well, I suppose the slitter has been one of the things we were talking about before, and I suppose Billy would have a strong opinion on that. Do you want to start us off there, Billy? Yeah. Uh, look, you see, um. Like, do you know, it was interesting with Rua there because because he's dead right. right. He's dead right. Like, Dublin on a ball does afford you to give away possession. And and as well, if you double on the slither now, you'll probably drive it wide. You know, it'll go out over the, the end line. And there's definitely, like, because of the slither, there's more wides, there's more time that the ball is out of play. At the same time, then, we're, we're possession-driven. So I'm kind of going, why is the ball out of play so much when we're possession driven? And it's because we can very easily manoeuvre the ball into a scoring position because we can score so far out the pitch. The reality is, if you can create a bit of space in your own 45, if you're Limerick, well, well you're comfortable enough beating a team from your own 45 with, with long range scores. 
it's brilliant. It's very clever. But I, I suppose I'm into the entertainment factor, you know, and that's just, you know, some people like the tactical side of it. I like the pure entertainment. And I, I'd say Shane will laugh at this, but even as a hurler, I was probably very frustrating with managers because, because I went out to express myself, whether that be a tap pickup or whatever, or a reverse hand pass that one time out of 10 mightn't come off and you get out. But you're kind of going, yeah, but that's, that's me. Like, that's, that's, what I, that's what you do. And that's why I play Harlan, because you get to express yourself. And I feel now, I, I feel now players are limited in what they can do to express themselves out there because it doesn't fit the system. But going back to the slither, I just think it, 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 it gives the opportunity to work the ball, to beat a team without getting a goal, right? So that's, that's number one. You can beat a team without getting a goal now. And number two, you don't see the same passages of Hurland anymore, which I think made Hurland, makes Hurland the great game it is, is the, these passages of play that go on for a minute and there's hooking and blocking and, and you can see the whole range of skills in that passage. Whereas now it's more like short phases of play. And I think the ball leads to that. That's not saying a heavier ball will change anything because Hurland's after improving and a heavier ball might actually get teams to say, well, they can't beat us from 45 yards, so let's just tuck back and defend more even. So I, I don't know, but it, but definitely the, the, the weight of the ball is contributing to, um, to shorter phases of play. And uh, I suppose another thing people will be talking about is kind of the referees, so it's very difficult with the speed of the game and the thoughts like a VAR or TMO coming into it. What would be your thoughts on that, Mr. Briggs? Yeah, like, it, it, I, I think just to go back to the Siller issue, I think it's not so much the, the Siller. Like, I remember, Adam, I remember being your your age and playing up in the Brothers there for the Friary one day. And I swear to God, you couldn't hit the Siller more than 20 yards because it was the old O'Neill Slitter. It, it had probably been inside, in, you know, the bag for the last two years. And it was like, it, it was like hitting, you know, a stone, basically. So, you get away from that and you see the new one and obviously the cork inside is, is more rubber based now than the actual bands it used to be. The one thing I say about the slitter is it needs to be regulated more. So like, I mean, there's huge deviations between the O'Neill slitter at 12 euros a pop, let's call it a spade a spade. And then some of the other ones that are coming in from Poland for say six euros. And it's like hitting a tennis ball. So even that new, like it's, it's horrible. I don't know if you come across the new um, aluminous slitter, you know, with the ridges on it. It's horrible. So, like, they need to... I'm not saying, like, you, you have one person making sitters and you have a monopoly, but I'm saying they need to be regulated better. And, you know, obviously into county, they're going to play with a brand new sitter all the time. So that's going to make it, you know, and on the best pitches and in the summer. So that's going to make the sitter fly a bit more. But I would say, like, even if it was just a small bit heavier, I'm not talking, you know, about putting an extra, you know, 20 grams on it, a small bit heavier, it, it might... Um, it might suit the game a bit better because I think, you know, what Billy's saying about the entertainment is that one of the reasons why um, the ball was in play so much is because people couldn't hit it as far or there was lots of mistakes and it made it incredibly exciting. And I suppose the, the fact that players are more programmed into holding on to possession nowadays, it's a possession game, they're not giving the ball away as much. Um, also I think with the hand passing issue what Bevan was saying it depends on the teams you're playing against because if you would have played like that against Kilkenny say 10 years ago they would have swarmed you and taken the ball off you time and time again and if you if you gave away possession like that anywhere on the middle of the field you know like again what Billy was saying about having scores or going for long range scores I can guarantee you one thing they would not have been going for long range scores because once they dispossessed you and transitioned then from a defence into attack you would have seen Eddie Brennan driving straight down the middle towards the goal so I think that's another evolution that needs to be brought in over the next number of while in terms of VAR I think the onside pitch monitor to me makes complete sense so just to give you an example there Gerard Hegarty brilliant season last year Bernard Hurler he absolutely letters the Hurley off of Joe Canning's back in the game last year like and then the ball is turned over and you're thinking to yourself right he's on his way to a red card here no one sees it now 
it's a physical game and these things happen and it's high speed, right? But to me, like, it was reckless. He was nowhere near the ball. He, he wasn't trying to hook him. He came in. Referee could have gone over there, right? Seeing this 10 seconds later, yellow card, move on. If for those kind of serious events, likewise, the Richie Hogan, it's been mentioned here a hundred times already on this channel, like, at high speed, it looked bad with, with Cahill Barrett. But when it was slowed down, I don't think it was anywhere near a red card. So, like, those small things, they change games. And to me, the monitor or the pitch side monitor for really serious consequences of games, I would like to see that and give the referees more attention because if you bring in the two referees, well, there's massive deviation between what this referee on this side, like a Brian Gavin, would let you away with and then a Fergal Horgan on this side. So, like, th that to me doesn't work either. So for those serious instances, I, I wouldn't mind seeing something like that. Uh, what do you think, Rua? I think there's I think there's a few things. We'll just go back to Billy's point about the slitter first. I think I think in every game, you know, the 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 ball evolves. So even if we look at rugby or we look at soccer, you know, I was looking at you know how how things are made. Is one of the programs is on one of the one of the satellite channels or how do they do it? I think is the name of it. And they were looking at the design of the of the soccer ball for one of the World Cups and. Even the the way they were trying to stitch the ball so that in bad weather that the the ball wouldn't take in water and it would stay at the same weight for the matches. So I think every sport, you know, the, the the ball evolves. Now, if you look at the slitter, the one thing that I think the core of the slitter does at the moment is there is less deviation in how far it will travel between wet and dry days, and that's one of the things that you get with a synthetic core. I think I do agree with Billy that it's probably a bit light, and at this stage of the game. The fact that the bigger goalkeepers, I remember Adrian Power playing underage for Waterford, <laughs> and he could land the ball on the opposite 14 on a on an ordinary day, like do you know, and if, if if that's starting to happen, or you know, we're starting to see maybe goalies scoring points, um, you know, at that stage of the game, maybe it's time to look at it and see. But definitely I think there has to be uniformity in the slitter. I know that in some club games in Cork that that the slitter has actually changed at half time. So one club uses their slitter in the first half. And the other club uses their slitter in the second half. So be it that they're using one team are using a Cummins ball, one club are using an O'Neill's ball. They change at half time and they use a ball, um, a different ball in the two halves. So that shows you that there's a difference. Um, on the VAR issue, Adam, I think it's a great point. And you know, I was at the All Ireland. I was actually on the side of the Richie Hogan incident in in that All Ireland and didn't see it and wondering why was the red card given. And I remember ringing a friend of mine at half time, asking him, you know, what did it look like on the telly? Did it look like it should have been a sending off? Because from sitting in the stand, literally almost opposite it, um, it definitely didn't look at it at the time. But my idea with VAR, and I've said this publicly for a while, is that teams are training so hard at the moment and are putting so much into it for eight or ten months a year. I know they're not at the moment with COVID and it's, it's a kind of a shotgun season, but they're putting so much into it. Like You can't play a team like Limerick when you're short a man. You know, whatever chance you have of being competitive and playing against them when you're 15, if the referee makes an incorrect decision and puts you down to 14, you haven't a, you haven't a hope. And my idea with the with the pitch side, and I think the pitch side monitor might be the way to go, is the referee is allowed to review it and make a decision based on what the rest of us were able to see. Because I think you're getting to the point where after eight months or nine months of training in an All-Ireland semi-final, if a referee makes an incorrect decision against you, it impacts your team who are down to 40 and it impacts you who's put a whole year of your life into it. And I think you're getting to the point where the stakes are too high to make a shotgun decision. You know, I see it in rugby, it's, it's entertainment or in soccer. You know, if you want to look at how to get it wrong, look at VAR and soccer over the, past, over the past year and a bit. But the bottom line is, I think there's too many, there's too many things riding on a decision that a referee can make at the moment in a big game. And I think he's entitled to go back and review it. What annoys me more sometimes is, from our perspective, you know, sometimes you end up with appeals with players and having to go and try and try and argue their case as to why an incident happened. And, you know, the referee in the car on the way home could be saying, geez, I was hard on that player, whatever the case may be. But because they've given them the red card, they have to stand by it. They have to produce a report. They have to put the report into Crow Park. And everybody stands by that report. And it's up to the team in question or the player in question to disprove what the referee said. And I remember in a case, I think it was with Morris Shanahan in, in after one of the league games who got a red card. And 
we made an appeal on behalf of Morris who was lo and lost it. And what we were told by the, by the appeals committee at the time or the, the hearings committee at the time was we neither proved nor disproved what happened. Therefore, the referee's word stood. So even looking back on the, on the, the recordings and the, the angles that we had of the, of the decision at the time, it neither proved nor disproved that the incident happened, but because the referee said it happened, it stood. Do you know what I need? I, I think we honestly need to get away from some of this and we need to get to the point whereby, you know, the players are central to it. In the game of rugby, the players are central to the decisions that are being made. We've seen some very borderline decisions with like the likes of Bundyaki over the last couple of weeks who were unfortunate to be red carded. But it was reviewed. The rule says that, or the, the law of the game says that if that's the case, it is a red card in that scenario and a red card was given and you can't argue with it. I think the GA scenario at the moment leaves too much open to interpretation. And I think video refereeing or some type of review would actually help it. I think as well as that, we all know the change in the GA happens really slowly compared to most other sports. But you often get this kind of crazy attitude where, well, we can't implement that at club level, so we can't have it at inter-county level. But like my point to that would be, well, Adam Murray doesn't look at Shane Briggs playing junior A and say, geez, I want to play Hurland because, you know, I'm following him. He looks at the top players in Ireland. Everything is top down. So in other words, the top, top players get the game right at the top level. You encourage youth to play. And then from there, look, the club is going to be the club. You can't obviously have VAR and all that kind of stuff at the club level. But at the same time, you're in, you'll have increased numbers and have a passion and love for the game. Bevan, the Camogie... I suppose, and even ladies football, which you're big into as well, are probably far more progressive when it comes to, say, sin bins and time clocks, etc. Like, uh, how have you found, um, I suppose, like, sin bins and those, you know, the progression of rules in the ladies game? I actually like the idea that, like, with the camogie last year, they brought in the new rules. And like, I think you need to be always changing the rules and trying out new things. And like a few of the rules that they have, they're probably going to change again, like tweak them a bit more and take out rules that they added in and change them. Um, but about the slitter, I just want to say, what do you do when they get used to the weight of the slitter? Like if you make the slitter heavier, what, what do you do in a, like five years time when the players get used to the weight of it again? and you're back at square one, do you make it a bit heavier again? And where do you stop, like, with it? And then the, the hurlies as well are a huge factor. Um, like, like I, I was only looking at a hurley I hurled with, uh, what, 15 years ago. And... You mean oh, a geez, wand, would, Billy? You mean a, a wand? wand. So I wouldn't... I tell you, I tell you, you'd want to be some hurl to hurl with because I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole now. You know, I'd say, jeez, yeah. how'd I hurl that? It will be interesting with, the, like, you know, the new bamboo hurleys coming in as well. And personally, I absolutely hate those. What do they call the cool tech ones? Um, shout out to Jane there who had one for ages. But like the, the new bamboo ones, they don't, like, they're, they're, they're promoting those as, oh, you get an even better strike off. But you're, like Rue is right. You would, if a goalkeeper would put a plank of steel in his hand, if he thought he put the ball over the bar from one into the other. So, I mean... And the bosses, of course, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, there's, there's lads playing out the field with goalkeepers' hurlies. Let's call a spade a spade. So, like, it's it's an issue. Like, But I, I think I think it's an issue both ways in a way that, OK, you're, there's far and against it. Like, if you have a huge hurley in your hand at this stage of the game, the idea that you're going to be able to, hooked is, be, able to be hooked is more. Now, if you look at Aaron Galan, Aaron Galan uses a 31-inch hurley. Yeah. Now, if you look at if you look at any of the rest of you, you know, hurling away at the moment, if somebody gave you a 31 inch hurley, it would probably take you six <laughs> months to get used to the fact that you were missing four or five inches off it. Do you know? So it just depends on, on the way you look at it. Yeah, the, the, the boss is a bit bigger. And, do you know, because certain players use certain hurdles and you find kids want to go in and order them and stuff like that. But, you know, I think, I think Bevan has a great point there from the point of view of the, of the slitter. You know, add 20 grams, they get used to it. Where do you go next? I think, I think you know, that, that's a definite thing. And the other thing, you know, when we're talking about progression of the game, you have to look at underage coaching and the skill level 
of underage players now like we all knew players we won't name them back in the 90s like who were completely one-sided you know at inter-county level hole in the hurry wrong you know left over right all these type of things they were getting away with it at the time you know some of those would probably not be considered at 14 or 16 years of age now because you'd want to develop their other side or you'd want to develop them properly before you'd let them into a to an inter-county setup you know, there were certain players like that. Now, you know, we won't start by name and any of our, you know, from that perspective. But I think that the, the level that you're coaching kids at now is so different to where kids were being coached at when, you know, some of some of us were starting off. Do you know, you just see a difference in an under-14 player striking off both sides. Bevan is completely right. I see the same thing with Camogie. You know, the Camogie final used to be played before the National League hurling final. And, you know, you go to Torres and the Camogie beyond. Like, 10 years ago, the Camogie final, you, you, you mightn't watch it. Do you think just, just the skill level in it wasn't, wasn't quite as high as what the men's game is? I see a complete difference now, and especially in ladies' football as well. The skill level of the, of the underage girls playing Camogie and playing ladies' football is 100 times what it was 10 or 15 years ago. You know, and going back to the point, just one more, and I won't hog it, but going back one more when you're talking about the, the, the opposition to rule change, like the GA made a decision almost 10 years ago now to take, the, to take the clock out of the hands of the referee. Now, ladies football, in fairness to them, have been doing it out of the boot of the car for almost 20 years now. And the GA have decided in their big stadiums where all their championship matches are on that they, they either can't or won't do it. And it just shows you the opposition sometimes to things that are completely practical. We all get frustrated when we don't know how much is left. You look at a ladies final in Crow Park or a semi-final and the kids counting the clock down. That's exactly the way you want the game. It's transparency. It's less pressure on the referee. And I think the ladies have got it spot on, to be fair. Do you know what kind of it comes to mind when you say that is, do you ever watch, you know, I remember watching um, uh, a World Championship snooker final about 20 years ago. And it came down, say, it was maybe 15 frames all coming down to the last frame. And we're talking about the best players in the world and they were making elementary mistakes because of the pressure. And if I, I think you'll see more of that in GA. When they look up at the clock and you see it counting down to two minutes, you know, one and a half minutes, there's guys who are going to literally start making simple elementary mistakes because of the pressure. I think like what Billy says, it all adds, you know, but the timing, I think that's, crazy that the referee is in charge of the time and then you have like how many times have you heard a referee abused oh sure he said four minutes but there was three substitutes or there someone went down injured and he look and, it's, and sometimes we know that you know maybe it's, it's a draw game the referee's thinking I'm going to I'm going to get out of dodge here so I'm just going to call this up straight away or there's a, a two points in it or a point in it and the next thing all of a sudden the ball's on the goal line and they're scrambling and then you know, it gets hit out and it blows it up. And next thing, everyone's given out. Everyone's given out, right? And I mentioned, like, everyone's got an opinion. But, like, the less responsibility the referee has for the things, you know, the minutiae that he doesn't really need to worry about. His attention should be on what's going on on the field. You know, the better, that's, that'll be my opinion. Um, I just want to go back to, then, to the point that Rue was making, I suppose, about coaching. And, Adam, I'm going to come to you. I suppose your own father is very involved in, in the coach and he's been involved with development squads and both, I suppose, football and Hurlem, we're concentrating on Hurlem today. Like, even over the last number of years, have you seen a difference in underage coaching um, as, I suppose, you're hoping more and more coaches are becoming educated and what you're doing in training as opposed to, you know, just, just going out and basically playing a game in training? I suppose there's probably a lot more knowledge uh, in a lot more people, like with all the courses you can do now. And even like the, with all the strength and condition and all that stuff, like even compared to like, I suppose 10 years ago, it's probably gone up another notch again. I suppose on the actual pitch itself, like uh, you're probably, probably look at, you're you probably looking at more stuff, like more specific skills that you want to work on, as opposed to just going out and saying, like doing the normal stuff of playing a match or whatever like that so I suppose it probably has come on that way but uh, it's hard to say really like because I, I haven't been training in so long now like I can barely remember what uh, I'd say the coaching has come on a fair bit but it's still it's still I suppose there's some there's some coaches who are like who are very good at implementing what they want to do and then there's others that are kind of 
they're implementing the wrong things, if you know what I mean. Mm. Like, yeah, the last thing we want to see, we're all very passionate about hurling here. The last thing we want to see, I suppose, is for players to become robots. And there's, there's, you need to marry, I suppose, that lovely possession based game, not turning over the ball with individual brilliance. Now, Rua, we spoke to Tony Buckley, who I would consider one of the best coaches in Ireland. And it doesn't really matter if it's football or hurling. And he said, the, like, the poorest trained skill in the GA is movement and I'd have to agree with him and Billy I'm going to go back to what you were saying the reason why you know if you now we see that say full forward lines are playing very narrow so like you see maybe two or three up almost like football was 20 years ago where they're on the edge of the square now I would contend that you could actually double on balls and you could hit ball off the ground if the movement of forwards was much better. The reason why it's become a possession-based game is because we're trying to give that 80-20 ball in. But because they're so narrow, it offers you it offers you opportunity up top to hit space or to come straight in. And if forward gets the first, um, I suppose, the first step, there's every chance you can win the ball. But that's not what happens. And I would contend that nowadays, forwards' movement is actually quite poor. Now, you have obviously exceptions to that. Galan, phenomenal. And you have other excellent in the county hurlers. But a lot of them are getting away with their pace. And they're using their pace to beat their man, as opposed to using their smarts to beat the man. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? So, Rua, what do, you think, what do you think about that point? That, like, you could actually move the ball in quicker first time if guys were tuned into the fact that that ball's coming in quicker? I, I, sorry, I agree with you. Um... You know, I think you have to. I think you have to pair it back a little bit further. And you know, if we're looking at senior intercounty or any any manager taking over a team, so whether we take over our local club team or whether we take over a county team, you know, our commitment is to the thirty or forty players involved in that panel. So we don't have commitment to tradition. We don't have commitment to entertainment. We don't have commit c- commitment to go into the far field and let people talk about the game that was played because it was absolutely fabulous and it's what they wanted to see. We have a commitment over the line to win a championship. And that's that's the priority of the managers and it's the priority of the of the, te- of, of the teams involved. So I think when you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, the game has gone robotic, it's gone too tactical, you know, we shouldn't be playing it like this. We should be looking more at this skill or that skill or the other skill. Shane as a coach or Billy as a coach, you're looking at, and even if we look back on the on the under-20, Shane, from before Christmas, you look at the players that you have involved in your panel and you make a plan based on what you feel is the best way to go with those particular players. And I don't think as a coach you can commit to entertainment. You can commit to giving, you know, to breaking tradition or to staying traditional or whatever the case may be. You actually have to go out and decide, okay, how are we best going to go about our business as a panel of players? And, you know, absolutely agreed with what you said about Donny from the perspective of movement. And, you know, Donny is one of these people that absolutely thinks outside the box all the time and is looking to add an extra dimension in whatever way we can. And you're right in the sense that, okay, you can accuse certain plays in the GA at the moment, if you can say that there are plays. There are certain plays there that are robotic, do you know? But yet again, you're trying to say, okay, if our team is in this given position, this is the shape we should adopt, or this is the way that we should try and play in that scenario. And, you know, you have to go down the road of... of giving the players as much as you can to help them on the field and then allow them their individual brilliance. I know, you know, going back to Billy's point about the ground hurling and stuff like that, two of the best goals, Paul Flynn scored a goal against Cork probably in four or five, straight off the ground, nearly took the head off the goalkeeper. Do you know? So these type of skills are still in their, are are still in their, their, their kit bag. You know, if you look at Shane, Shane Bennett's individual goal, our brilliant finish against Dublin in the championship in 2015 or 16, where he dropped the ball in the 21 all alone, took one shot at it and hit the top corner. Do you know, they still have them. It's not saying, it's not saying that, you know, it's not being coached. I think they have them as good as any other players had them. It's a question of when you want to use them. So going back to the point, Shane, I think looking at, looking at what the likes of Tony Buckley and stuff are trying to do from a movement perspective, like if you look at, 
Dublin in football, I know we're on hurling at the moment, but Dublin in football, the individual movement of each of the players is far superior. Don't talk about money in Dublin or you know any other thing in Dublin. The skill level of the players and the movement of the players is infinitely better than, than any other team. And I think you could, do, you could say the same about Limerick at the moment. It's what's given Limerick their edge. And especially, I think, that movement... I would, in soccer, it's often called tiki taka, where they, they play in triangles, coming off the shoulder at, at pace on the angle to deliver the ball under less pressure. Bevan, I'd be interested in you, like obviously, you're involved an awful lot with the Komogi. You know, how does the average training session work for you? Do you spend most of your time just doing skills and then we play a game, or is there game based scenarios, or do you work on tactical work within training? Um, mostly what we do is like we'd spend a lot of the time in a hurling ball alley and we'd be working on striking literally straight to hand. That's what's being drilled into us is straight to hand because we're trying to have the ball traveling as fast as possible and be able to ping a ball into someone's hand instead of having a first touch into your hand because they're training us that we should be able to say hit the ball from the half forward nearly straight into someone's hand in the full forward line and try cut out um, dropping the ball or making mistakes. So we do that the whole time at training. So it's just a matter of repetition and it's drilled into our heads nearly. Mm -hmm. And then we would kind of go into possession games. So working in small areas and just holding on to possession for as long as possible and then just do a bit of fitness as well to keep that up. Yeah, like uh, mm, it's interesting hitting the ball to hand. I'd kind of contend, Billy, that good cornerbacks would probably be um, <laughs> they'd, they'd be chewing the ear off you. Uh, like, Billy, you're a man who loves skills, right? Anytime I've ever uh, been involved with you, you're all the time, you're excellent working with people one on one, especially with, you know, shortening hurlies and getting ball into your hand. Um, like, do you see. Where do you see this possession-based stuff going? Um, well, it, it's possession-based because the, the, the players have the skill to, to enact it, right? You, you wouldn't have been able to have a possession game in the 90s for a few different reasons. The refereeing was different, first of all. And secondly, the players hadn't the skill to put a ball to someone's hand 40, 40 yards out, be that because the hurley, the skill level, or the ball. Okay? So um, the, the one thing I'd say, though, is uh, they say practice makes perfect. No, no, like perfect practice makes perfect. And I was very, very lucky that I, I coached, like I, I trained under some absolutely brilliant, like brilliant people that would show you technique in how to win a ball in the air and just, just simple stuff like letting, you know, slipping behind the guy and letting him go first and shielding his hand and all that. But, but I have, like, yes, coaching has improved at a certain level. But don't for a minute think that there's kids, the length and breadth of Ireland, being shown wrong stuff. Like, like you know, um, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And there is a, geez, we're, we're, we're full of lads in the G8 who take a team out of the goodness of their heart. But they don't really know what they're doing. And you'll see then the fruits of that coming through. Lads holding the hurley wrong. Lads not knowing how to how to protect their hand you know they'd be told put the hurley behind your hand and you're kind of going that's absolute nonsense you know <laughs> pure nonsense like um you're, they're not showing the technique but but i do look i do think um the skill level in general and it's because of coaching and it's because of street hurling don't 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 um don't eliminate the the, the skills that people get by just pucking a ball around and and trying different things and chatting to their friends and stuff but but that all the fact that this, you know, young lads now are constantly tapping the ball and pinging the ball to each other, it's gone into inter-county hurling now where they're, they're comfortable doing that. The one thing I would, I would question, and that is, I look at a lot of training now, and it's all short, right? Short, short, short. Everyone pinging a ball and short. But what I think that is leading itself into, and I've seen it in my own club, a lad gets a ball in his hand then, and his instinct is to look short. And I'm saying to my the lads I'm coaching, I'm saying, yeah, I, that's fine. But I want you opening up your eyes. I want you pinging a ball to a guy, not hitting it nowhere. 
but I want you hitting a 60 yard pass, not a 20 yard pass. So I need you to open your mind and open your eyes and see, see that, I suppose, into a vaster area. And I think this, this kind of possession and tapping to the hand, it does kind of coach guys into just getting a ball and just seeing within 20 yards of themselves to pass the ball. So I do think that's a danger. Yeah, look, uh, um, you definitely need both. I remember, like, you know, you back in my my generation, like, you'd be marking Paul Flynn or you'd be marking John Milan, and, of course, everyone else would be gone out the field, and every single ball, didn't matter which way it was coming, it was coming, and, like, it was you one-on-one. -on -one. I suppose now with the advent of sweepers or with, you know, guys filling back in space, but I, I agree with you, you need to be able to play both sides of it because if you can suck the defence out, you need to hit the ball in first time. Adam, just moving on, because we could talk about coaching all day, and I would. Uh, competition structure. Where? How would you are, you... are you happy with the provincial championships the way they are with the five and five? Or do you think, you know, is there more need for... Or would there lend itself better to a Champions League style draw? Or what do you think? Uh, I think we should keep the some sort of provincial championships. It's hard to say, really, but with the found with the games, kind of, I suppose the first year they did them was it 2018 uh, when they had have four matches in four weeks. Like, just the standard matches wasn't wasn't as good as like say just going up to Starless for a Munster semi final. And if you lose, you have to go into the qualifiers. Like, it just it wasn't the same stakes weren't there, and the matches weren't as intense or enjoyable. I found. So I, I know they were trying to uh, get more games for the players and all that, but I didn't think they really needed to go away from some sort of knockout because it's kind of, uh, the way it's gone, it's kind of like if they lose, they still have another chance. They still have two or three more chances rather than just having one. And I suppose with the the new structure, with the, the all our finals going to be in July, I suppose there's going to be even less time for... Like there's going to be four or five matches in four or five weeks, so you wonder what kind of standard the games are going to be at. Like, hmm. what you I think I'd actually worry about that because, yeah, we need to look after the club player. Jesus, we do. But but like, at the same time, our flagship is is the, the All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship, and that's where young lads look at these players, and you know that's where the romance comes out of. And I would hate for a position where where a young lad supports Manchester United for 10 months of the year, and then he supports Watford for two. You know, because then he doesn't see him anymore. And I I, oh, I, I don't know. I just think um, I, I think maybe we, we rushed into it with the pandemic of shortening that championship. Uh, yeah, so. but I think that's just a consequence this year, isn't it? In the last two years, the pandemic. Like, when it goes back to hopefully next year, you're going to see inter-county teams um, playing a full National League you're going to see them with a full month championship or less championship, and you're going to see them in a full All Ireland series. Uh, I agree with you. You always want GA to be on the front or the back pages, front and center. And I think you will get more exposure. I think it's just this year because the way things are looking now, National League probably three games in May, trying to get it done and to give the, the club player because the club player is 90% of the association or 99%. So I think next year you're going to see a lot more. Uh, Rue, are you happy enough with the structure the way it is? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. You know, the, the pandemic has shown us that, number one, the split the split season can be done. You know, this was something that was that was up in the air for years before this as to how you'd how you'd allocate time for the club player and how you'd allocate time for the inter-county player. And I think if there's one positive from the pandemic, it's the idea that, you know, it can be done and the club player now has his time. Um, as far as the structure of the championship is concerned, I liked the, the round-robin idea. I liked the idea that there were games in Welsh Park. And this was something that as kids, you know, there hadn't been a big championship match in Welsh Park from, from 1996 to 2018. I know they played Kerry there one year in an opening round of a championship and they played a qualifier, I remember, against Galway, but Munster Championship really wasn't a thing that people could see in Waterford City. And I think if there was any benefit from the round robin series, I enjoyed, even though Waterford were beaten in the two games against Clare and Limerick in 2019 in Welsh Park, I enjoyed going to those games um, for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's because I'd, I'd spent my time since 2011 to 2018 being involved. But the idea of being down around 
you know, the clubhouse in Ronmore, the clubhouse in Mount Sinai, and meeting Waterford people in Waterford City, going to see Waterford playing was a complete novelty. And to be honest with you, I enjoyed both the matches, even though Waterford were beaten. I thought it was something positive for the GA in Waterford. And I think if you'd redevelop Welsh Park and go, you know, and see Waterford play in a, in a fantastic new stadium like that, you know, I think it only has to be supported. You know, there's a certain theory out there that, you know, certain people said, ah, the, the, the round robin series doesn't suit Waterford. They're better suited to a knockout championship. I think that's just a, it's, it's a way of thinking. You know, I think championship matches are what people want to play. If you can get four of them in the Munster Championship, it just happened that we were pipped by Clare one year. You know, we were actually pipped the year before as well, if you look at it, by the ghost goal in Limerick, even though people would say Waterford were, were poor in 2018. The ghost goal in Limerick would have given us a win. And we narrowly lost the game against Cork in the final round, even though we were missing about nine or ten players. And we might have got over the line if there was an incentive there. The unfortunate thing for Waterford in both years is they were actually out of the championship by the time they played the last game. So I'd be in favour of definitely giving it one big push again. As you say, Shane, in, in 2022, we'll be looking at a full Munster Championship. I'd like that to be a round robin again. See how we go and make a decision from there. What do you think, Bevan? I, it doesn't really bother me now, but I'd agree with what Adam said that like there's it's not really all on the line with knockout that like you if you lose a match you're kind of it's not all lost for you but it wouldn't it wouldn't make much difference to me now like I I do think that the more matches you're kind of getting a bit more experience so it would help the players in the end mm. yeah like when well, I look at from the players point of view anyway like and even having played years for Waterford footballers, we could often be play, uh, back training in November, and you could play a maximum of two championship games um, a month between each other with the qualifiers. And I think that's just madness. Players want to play games, so I, I would definitely keep the round robin. Now, as someone who absolutely loves loves the month championship, I'd still love to see a scenario where maybe. Just for just to see how it works out, where like if you have a strong month's championship, you have five super teams, or you know that are basically going to knock each other out, like be like the Lens or the Ulster Football Championship. Well, maybe we go into a seeded draw where, um, you know, the the two All Ireland finalists go into a seeded draw, and you you break it all the way down. So you when the draw comes out, you could have a chance of playing against two or three teams from Leinster. As well, I think that could really spice it up. Uh, you know, where you could you could be yourselves, Cork, you know, Wexford, uh, Kilkenny, and a and other. So I, I I wouldn't limit myself straight away to the um, just to the month championship, Lens championship. I I I'd leave all avenues open. Um, I, I one other thing I want to touch on as well, and maybe we'll start with you, Bill, um, with Inter County is that there's a worrying trend. We've seen it in the football, and now we've seen it in the hurling. Now, I'm not going to disparage Dublin or Limerick and say there hasn't been phenomenal work put in underage, right? which there obviously has. And they have the best players, and they're the best run, and they're probably the best managed. But there's a worrying trend where you have the Dublin footballers have more funding and have the ability to bring in more funds through sponsorship than everybody else. You have Limerick, who everybody knows, it's no secret, are being bankrolled by JP. Now, all of a sudden, we now have the two best teams in Ireland who are also the best funded. And that's a worry. And we have a small county like Waterford who find it hard now, could do a lot more to bring in funds, but find it hard to generate. They don't have as many multinationals or backers. So, like, is there anything that can be done like, about this in the GA? Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I, I kind of have an insight into this because I remember years ago, um, I would have trained the Tony Forrestal team, and when the tournament finished, a guy who I didn't see from, the, from November to the summer barged into the dressing room and started taking the jerseys off lads as if they were going to steal them. And a bit of an altercation happened between myself and him because I turned. And what I said was, I said, we've done the hard work. 
we've got the best players that are 14 years of age and it took us five months to do it, but we've done it. Now I said, I'll tell you this, those very same best hurlers in Waterford are also the best soccer players in Waterford and some of them are the best rugby players in Waterford. And I was speaking to a Limerick guy and I said, how would you change it around? How would you change the thinking? And he said, we had to spoil our players because like you, like Waterford, the best hurlers are often the best soccer players and the best rugby players. And he said, if we didn't spoil them in hurling, they would have went where they were going to get spoiled. So I suppose Limerick had the money to spoil them. I think we have them because it doesn't take that much money to spoil underage lads, whatever about a senior in the county team. But like, are we are we keeping the best hurlers that we have that are under 14? I see a lot of our hurlers who I know, but they're also great soccer players and they're gone playing soccer and gone playing rugby. If you're a brilliant whatever hurler in Limerick, I think you're sticking playing hurling, you know, and, and as long as they're looking after you. Kilkenny, you're sticking playing playing hurling there too. And I, I just think I just think we need to whatever about putting millions into our senior team, I think we need to put money into our underage in order that we get and keep the best hurlers at that age. Yeah, Rua, Wexford brought out, a, I don't know, did you see it yesterday, a massive document there for the player pathway for all their development squads. And I know there's been great work done, in fairness, to Jason Ryan, Johnny Moore and Benji Whelan to do the same in Waterford. Um, like, you've, you've seen the cold face of probably, you know, penny pinching and trying to get funds for your senior team. Like, uh, are we spending enough money, you think, in this county on our underage teams and looking after our underage players? Well, I think what you need, you know, to, to, to pair it back even further than that is you need a vision. And you need to be in a scenario where you want to be very sure about where you want to go and how you get there. And I think if we look back at Limerick, you know, pre-2017, we could even be going back to, to 14 or 15. The appointment at the time of Anthony Daly is the director yeah. of underage hurling in Limerick is where that started. Now, that's, that's a small budget in comparison to what we're talking about overall with inter-county teams and the Dublins and the Limericks of the world. To be honest with you, I feel that's where Limerick have got the, have got the advantage from, is sorting out their underage structure and moving on from there. I don't buy into, okay, if you flood the thing with money, you're instantly guaranteed success. Because if you look at the Dublin hurlers, it hasn't happened. You know, they've, they've, they've flooded the thing with money. I couldn't say whether the Dublin hurlers of 2021 or 2020 are any better than when Anthony Daly won a league with him, probably back in 13 or 14 or whenever, maybe before that, 12. You know, so I think what you got to do is you got to get your structures right. And there's been a massive effort in Waterford over the past year, you know, to look at that. Interestingly, if you look at Limerick and the current, under, the current Limerick senior team, Waterford went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them as minors in 21s. You know, we got an All-Ireland in, in 2013 at minor level, beaten by Limerick in the Munster final. Um, questionably, in, in, in Limerick, we were about 10 points up with, with, with 20 minutes to play in the Gaelic rounds in Limerick the same year and ended up losing that Munster final. Lost to them again in 2014. Um, so they ended up with two Munster Championships at minor level. We ended up with an All-Ireland minor. They ended up with two 21s. We ended up with, with one 21. And probably then Limerick got a little bit of an edge and got their, their, their coaching structure right from the point of view of their senior team with John Kiley and Paul Canark and all the elements that were dragged into that that has brought Limerick to where they are. But to be honest with you, looking at last year, while you'd be disappointed with the result of the All-Ireland final, I think it's massively encouraging that we seem to have closed the gap on Limerick. And from mm. our perspective in Waterford, I feel that we can, we can, if not close it, we can better ourselves. We were as good as they were toe-to-toe -to -toe five years ago. And all we've got to do is, is get another couple of things right. I think the coaching structure in Waterford at the moment at senior level is, is very, very good. I think Mikey Beavens and, <laughs> and Liam Cahill and everybody else that's involved in that management team you know, we'll get another 10 or 15% out of those players in the next year or two. And we'll be back to where these boys aren't afraid of Limerick. They were beating Limerick at underage at every opportunity. And I think you can look at it both ways. You can look at the JP factor and say, all right, pump money into it and you'll get there. I don't believe that. I believe what you do is get your underage structure right and end up in a scenario where you're competitive at every grade. Cork are at it now. We see it. 
you know, with the last couple of years, Cork have gotten their underage structures right. We need to get there and build again and go again. But I see no reason the next year or two, funding or not, that our senior team at 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 um, intercounty hurling level can't be at the level that Limerick are at the moment. Yeah, look, I mean, when I said about funding, I wasn't talking exclusively about just their senior team. I was I was talking about the drip down approach all the way down through. Very interesting as well. It's it's probably a conversation for another day, but I remember early nineties. Waterford won the under twenty one All Ireland ninety one. Do you know? Do you know they beat in the final, Rua? Uh, Offaly. Offaly won two All Irelands in the next uh, few years. We regularly beat Cork in the Munster Championship. They won two All Irelands in a row, and then of course, you're, as you said now, like we we regularly beat Clare. Right, they won not Ireland in two thousand thirteen, and we and we've regularly beaten Limerick, and those players have pushed on. So maybe that is an area where Waterford really need to look at that. We are producing excellent minors. Um, that gap from minor to, tw- to twenty up to senior, we like, and even DJ Form was on here a few weeks ago talking about maybe he didn't appreciate the gap number one and what he needed to fill that gap. Um, and personally, and he, he you know, he's he's lost out in a couple of years, probably of his development. So I think that's that's going to be a huge thing going forward. Um, very quickly, with five minutes left. If there's one thing, one change you'd like to see um, in Harlan. I'm going to start the ball rolling, and I'm going to think outside the box. I've mentioned a few things, but I would like to see um, they didn't rugby back in the 80s, early 90s, where uh, teams were taking penalties. A uh, penalty was worth three and a try was worth four, so they upped the try to five. I'd actually like to see a trial where a goal is worth five points. All right. That might incentivize uh, a bit more, you know, uh, offensive play. Uh, Billy, quickly, anything else? He's on, you're on mute, Bill. Sorry, First time we shut him up all day. Uh, yeah. Go on. on the five points for a goal, yeah, definitely, right? That one, and also, I want, I want um, the, the the tackle, the 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 bloody trailing arm grabbing the lad going past, grabbing it, obstructing them, tackling them, whatever you want to call it. I want that that gone, but you need to enforce the four five steps rule to be able to do that. So I want that enforced. And I want this hand going across, stopping a lad breaking a tackle. Gone. Bevan, what do you think? Um, Like the Camogie, I'd like to see two points for a sideline because Joe Canning Canning done against Limerick only last season. He scored about four sidelines and Galway probably would have won the game if they had two points because that would have been eight points. So I'd kind of like to see that now and you'd see a lot more people going for a sideline maybe over the bar. Ah yeah, look, there's no no such no such thing as a bad idea in this. Rua, what do you think? No, I think to be honest with you, um, what I wouldn't like to happen with with, with Hurling over the past, over the next year or two or three is that the same cynicism comes into it that Gaelic football had to had to endure about 15 mm-hmm. years ago when you go back to the Armaz and the Tyrones of the early noughties. I think we've seen a little bit of negativity in Limerick's play, even though we've we've complimented them from you know the point of view of what they've brought to the game over the last couple of years. I just didn't like the way they approached um, the idea of taking certain players out on certain plays when they felt that there was a danger of conceding scores. There's a very interesting picture in the examiner from yesterday of a tackle on Stephen Bennett from the All-Ireland final last year. And he's actually caught in a headlock. If it was rugby at the moment, he'd have got a straight red card for it. Yeah. Um, and I think it just, it just highlights the cynicism um, that's beginning to creep in. I think with Limerick, it was evident last year. I think it's something that needs to be stamped out ASAP moving forward. It's it's something that actually we thought about mentioning earlier on, which was, you know, in, again, we're talking about rugby, but where someone on the team might have to pay the, the penalty for increased tactical fouling. So, for instance, when you call in the captain and you say, Rua, look, that's six fouls now in a row. You're, you're stopping the flow of the game. Next person is crazy one. They're gone to the sin bin for 10 minutes. Um, it, it worked in rugby perfectly. Uh, I can't see why that can't work in the GEA. Especially, I do not want to see this, the cynical fouling of football and tactical fouling of football creeping in, which it is. Adam, what do you think? Yeah, I'd probably just say the similar things that you're saying, just to kind of get the game more attack and flow on. I don't know. 
just something to get the teams kind of playing it in long and just to to have kind of a more flowing game rather than the, the short passing that we've seen. But that's probably what I'd want to see, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank all my guests today for the great chat and can I please ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. This is so important to us as it helps us grow the channel. Next week, we'll pick our British and Irish Lions rugby team with Neve Briggs and look at the state of football with some very special guests. See you all soon on Extra Time.